from the gospel, hear these words. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people conferred together against Jesus in order to bring about his death. They bound him and led him away and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. When Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he repented and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. He said, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, what is it to us? See to it yourself. Throwing down the pieces of silver in the temple, he departed and went and hanged himself. But the chief priest taking the pieces of silver said, it is not lawful to put them in the treasury since they are blood money. After conferring, conferring together, they used the money to buy the potter's field as a place to bury foreigners. For this reason, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. And they took 30 pieces of silver, the price of the one on whom the price had been set, on whom some of the people of Israel had set a price, and they gave them for a potter's field, as the Lord commanded. May God's blessing be added to the reading and the understanding of the word. So, this being April 15th, you might have looked at the sermon title and thought I was going to rail against the IRS <laughs> next year. But no. No, no, blood money. The concept of guilt in the Old Testament and guilt by association was very strong. And if you had this guilt on you, there were specific ways you could be rid of it, but certain things could never be cleansed, could never be cleansed. And this guilt, this power of blood was important. It's why Pilate washes his hands before the whole community to show that he doesn't want the blood on him. The power of blood is a source of life and death. Blood was used in ancient times as a way of, of overcoming sin, but also a way of sealing covenants. The power of blood is the source of life and death. And the stain of wrong of guilt blood the stain think of mrs macbeth in hamlet and or in macbeth the play macbeth and she washes her hands over and over again trying to get the stain of murder out of her hands the famous line out out damn spot she can't get the blood the vision of the blood off of her hands we carry that guilt that stain of innocent blood so the 30 pieces of silver by our guilt, their guilt, their blood money, and, and the betrayal that goes with them makes that blood money no longer fit for the temple. And Judas, Judas is the one who betrays. Judas is the one we see as the bad guy in the story. You ever heard of the Judas goat? When, when sheep are to be led into the pen for slaughter, they first send a goat through because the goat gets to go through and comes out the other side safe. And so the rest of the sheep follow. The goat betrays them. Does Judas deserve this rap? Blood, money, and guilt? Does Judas deserve this? They call him Judas Iscariot. And some think it's the name of a town in Judea, which is interesting. If he's from Judea, then he's not. All the rest of them are Galileans. And in those days, as now, the Galileans look down on the Judeans, and the Judeans look down on the Galileans, you know, just like we look down on the people in Wheat Ridge, because we know they're no good, you know. Is he one of those? And, and if he was a Judean, was he more educated? Was he of the Levite class? Was he a priest or trained to read and write? And then how would he feel about these lousy fishermen who never seem to understand what Jesus is saying are probably illiterate, may never have gone to temple in their entire lives? How does he feel about these guys? It sets up a kind of mutual enmity between Judas and the rest of him. And maybe he feels like, I understand it, and these rubes don't. 
Another theory is that Iscariot is a term for Sicarii, which were assassins trying to overthrow Roman domination. He's also called a zealot. Zealots were, were violently opposed to Roman domination. They were, they were out there causing murder and insurrection. We heard of another guy who does murder and insurrection. Barabbas? Hmm. Hmm. Also, these people were violently anti-collaborator. Anyone who was working with the Romans was a, was a target to be killed. Maybe Judas, Judas had to deal. Maybe, maybe he sees in Jesus not some not some mythical king, not some far off deal, but, but someone who can be a focal point for a general uprising, a real war, a real bringing all the people together and throwing off the Roman yoke and establishing Israel once again as a free nation under God. Maybe he sees Jesus as the one who can drive out the Romans, drive out the Greeks, that, that polluting influence in their society. Jesus has been adequately anti-establishment against the priests and the leaders of the temple. Those guys are collaborators with the Romans. He'll get rid of them. We'll get rid of all of them. We'll have the righteous kingdom that somehow is promised and not down the road, but now. And Judas sees in Jesus. It might happen now. All the things we've desired to be a righteous nation, a return to the glory days. And why not? This isn't just some guy. It's the Son of God. Why not? Now. So the betrayal, the betrayal, that kiss, betrayed with a kiss, well, a kiss wasn't an uncommon greeting in those days. And you have to remember, everybody pretty much wore the same kind of clothes. All the men wore the same beards and the same hair. And so it would have been hard to distinguish in a group if you didn't know which one was Jesus. I mean, we see the paintings with the halos. Yeah, those weren't really there. So you wouldn't have known which one he was. So to go up and greet him and say, Rabbi, an innocuous betrayal, but to say, oh, this is the one you want. This is the one you want. Maybe it was a setup with Jesus, you know? With the crowds around Jesus all the time, the scribes and the Pharisees feared to arrest him for fear of a riot. And, and this was the way that Jesus figured it could happen without violence, that this betrayal would identify Jesus and only Jesus would be taken instead of coming in and arresting all the disciples, in which case they probably all would have been killed eventually, that only Jesus gets arrested. Only maybe the two of them worked it out. Maybe, maybe Judas did it to force Jesus' hand. I've always thought Judas, if he really understands who Jesus is, but he doesn't know how it's going to work, he goes, well, you know what? We'll force his hand. We'll get him arrested. We'll put him before those authorities. He's been really tough on the temple people before. Why not now? And maybe if they threaten him with death, he'll go into transformer mode and, you know, really rise up and draw him in. Maybe, maybe he'll force his hand and we'll get it done. Doesn't work perhaps the way Judas thinks, but either way, it worked to God's purpose. Jesus is arrested. There's no violence there, plenty of violence for Jesus. Jesus is arrested, dragged away, condemned, and Judas sees it. He's the bad guy in all of this? What about Peter? Peter denies Jesus three times right before his face. What about the rest of the disciples? They run off and hide. The only ones with enough guts to even stand there and watch him die on the cross is a few of the women who have been following him. All of them will turn away. 
Peter, or Judas, excuse me, Judas, when he sees this, that he's condemned, he says he repented and brought back the 30 pieces of silver. He says, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. Judas knows what he's done, knows he's sinned, repents. Isn't that what's asked of us? Acknowledge your sin and repent. Judas, is he the bad guy? One gospel, this one says Judas goes and hangs himself. Another gospel says Judas goes out and explodes. His guts just swell up and he explodes, which is, I think, the most horrible thing they could think of to do to him. There's the gospel of Judas, which was found not that long ago, translated not that long ago, um, which talks about Judas and Jesus having a conversation, the resurrected Christ having a conversation uh, about how it had to happen that way. And, and it's okay, Judas. But then the, the, the disciples come and stone him to death anyhow. We don't know what happened. We know that Judas was a scapegoat. Judas becomes this, this image of a scapegoat for, for all of history. Oh, he's the one who betrayed him. And then by association, well, it's the Jews that betrayed Jesus and killed him. Judas did it, and he was a Jew, and the rest of them the Jews. And so we can put him in ovens. Can't do that. It doesn't work that way doesn't work that way. Jesus died for our sins. We betray Jesus every time we turn back to sin. We betray Jesus with a kiss every time we return to our old ways, every time we falter and fail. And the great good news is that by grace, every time, just like Judas, we are forgiven completely, wholly, fully, the joy of Easter, that Christ is alive and that we are forgiven. Amen.